You're listening to the OCD Stories podcast, hosted by me, Stuart Ralph. The OCD Stories is a podcast dedicated to raising awareness and understanding around obsessive compulsive symptoms. I do this through interviewing inspired therapists, psychologists, and people who have experienced OCD. Welcome to the OCD Stories. And welcome to episode 309. And in this episode, I chat with Emily Hemmendinger. Emily is a lead therapist at the University of Colorado Health Outpatient Psychiatry Clinic. And in this episode, we talk about her therapy story and also her own mental health story, including OCD and an eating disorder. We discuss cognitive flexibility, cognitive remediation therapy, working on perfectionism, social anxiety, social media, and some tips for the mindful use of it, and much more. I enjoyed this episode, and I hope you guys do too. And thanks as always to NoCD for supporting the work that I do. NoCD offers affordable, effective, convenient therapy available in the US and outside the US. If you wanted to find out more about their therapy services and whether they take your insurance currently, head over to go.treatmyocd.com forward slash the OCD stories or the link will be in the episode description. So thank you to Emily for her time. And of course, thank you to you guys for listening. I deeply appreciate it. And without further ado, here is Emily. So welcome to the show, Emily. I'm so happy to be here. Big yes. fan. Now, oh, thank you. It's good to have you here. And as we discussed earlier, we get to hear your therapy story. Yeah. Um, so why, why I'm into therapy. Yeah, and why you became a therapist and specifically OCD. Um, yeah, so... The therapy story, I, I've obviously I've listened to this show and it's, this is the question for whatever reason I've kind of, I, I feel a little anxious about, but um, for full transparency, I'll, I'm going to share this because it's really important to me to decrease mental health stigma, but um, I have always felt a calling to help people and um help people feel understood if they're misunderstood. Um, My cute little therapy story is as a two-year-old, I was a huge fan of the Grinch. Um, And and my parents asked me why. And I said, well, I think he's misunderstood. Um, And, you know, like I wanted to support him and be his friend. Um, So I, (laughs) <laughs> That's my cute therapy story. I've always felt uh, calling to helping people and helping people help themselves. Um, specifically why OCD is um, since I was probably a, a toddler, um, I've had OCD myself. Um, I was diagnosed when I was a teenager Um around age 15, when at the same time I was getting treatment for anorexia nervosa. Um, And I am currently 14 years recovered from my eating disorder. So that is a thing that is in my past, but as you might know, that they're very co-occurring. So um, I became an eating disorder therapist uh, because I was given the chance to get my life back. And I wanted to give that to others, um, through therapy. So I did eating disorder therapy for a while, um, and learned through that treating OCD using ERP. Um, and I found I was super passionate about working with OCD. Um, my own journey with my OCD is it's something I didn't start talking about until I became an OCD therapist. Um, and my boss, uh, Dr. Rachel Davis has really helped me, um, decrease my shame around that and the stigma I felt so that I feel at a place now where I can share it with others. And, um, I'm learning more and more about my own OCD every day through my journey as an OCD therapist. That's awesome. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you for sharing and being so open. Um, so, you know, there's a few topics we're going to talk about today, which yeah. are all obviously interests of yours. So first, let's talk about cognitive flexibility. 
slash cognitive remediation therapy just anything you want to say on this and its relation to OCD yeah so um cognitive flexibility it's a big piece of um, acceptance and commitment therapy um folks with OCD tend to be pretty rigid in their mindset right like Mm. um whether it's rigid with routines um getting caught up in the details uh you know, not being able to see the bigger picture, feeling really overwhelmed by emotions in the moment. Um, and so cognitive flexibility is, is this idea of being able to um, work on a couple different things, whether it's like moving from detail to big picture and shifting back and forth, holding both those things at the same time, holding multiple ideas at the same time, um, set shifting is, is a piece of cognitive flexibility, being able to move from one task to the next, leaving things unfinished, um, maybe leaving things unfinished or not feeling just right. Um, and ultimately like being able to be accepting of, um, that flexibility of, uh, being more go with the flow. Um, So cognitive remediation therapy, um, it's not super well known, um, but it's something I learned through my treatment of eating disorders. Um, It was originally, I believe it was actually in England, uh, was was, uh, founded. Um, And it was used in the treatment of schizophrenia. as a way to help people with schizophrenia um, target that cognitive rigidity and increase their ability to do their activities of daily living through um, a set uh, a set type of like activities that targeted um, set shifting and looking at the big picture um, and that cognitive flexibility and then they saw that there was an improvement. So it's also been used with anorexia um, because anorexia nervosa also has that extreme rigid perfectionism and uh, lack of cognitive flexibility. Um, So it's the, whether it's around like food rules, um, numbers, diets, uh, calories, all of that. And it hasn't really been studied with OCD. However, I find that because eating disorders and OCD have so much overlap, it really does target a lot of that same cognitive rigidity um, and that flexibility that is needed in order to, you know, practice ERP and uh, move towards our values. Um, So, so cognitive remediation therapy, and and you could stop me if you have other questions. Um, but I can give an overview. Um, so it's, 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 it's a set of develop. It's, it's, how do I want to describe it? It's developing cognitive strategies, um, to improve like thinking skills. It's kind of like a therapy that's thinking about your thinking, not in a compulsive way, but like thinking about your thinking style. So there's detail oriented and big picture thinking and neither is necessarily better or worse, but each has its strengths and weaknesses. And so this therapy has different tasks or activities that you will, that like I would do with my client in session. And then we process through it and look at what is the like, was this more detail oriented? Were you more big picture thinking in this style? Um, and like, <clears throat> how is this helpful? How is this not helpful? What are the benefits? What are the weaknesses? Um, again, looking at like how we can move, to, uh, move more flexible, flex, flexibly, <laughs> flex, <Yeah>. uh, <laughs> you know, move through both of them, both styles and, and hold both. Um, Mm. it's all about like reflecting on our thinking styles, um, and exploring 
different ways to to view things. Um, So different things, you know, there are the things you do in therapy, but there are the sort of things they would do outside that are more exposures. So um, driving to work a different way, um, taking a different walking route, walking your dog a different way, um, brushing your teeth with your non-dominant hand, uh, putting on your clothes in a different order. Uh, um, so if it's always shirt, then pants, do pants, then shirt. Um, these little shifts help our brain increase its plasticity and flexibility. It's Mm -hmm. all about like recreating those, those pathways in our brain. Mm -hmm. Um, and I mean, you can do things where a lot of, a lot of times in sessions, I'll do things where I'll start to have a, have a client start a task, um, like say, uh, cleaning their bathroom and um, if that's something they struggle with, and then I'll have them do everything except the toilet and then leave it. And then we'll go and do something completely different. So um, leaving things unfinished, leaving things where they're not just right, challenging perfectionism. Um, all of these things are uh, targeted by cognitive remediation therapy. That was a very long winded no. explanation. <laughs> That's interesting. And like I said, it's not it's not a type of therapy I've I've come across before. And I think I'm pretty well versed in therapy. So I'm not sure how I've missed it. But it's interesting. Um and yeah, I like the example of, you know, if you put your shirt on first, usually switch that and put your trousers on, you know, before your shirt, whatever it is, or socks or pants, you know. Um and even if you're not maybe uh, anxious about either of those things, I guess, am I right in saying it, it's still showing your brain that you can constantly mix things up. And then yeah. it, it, in the same way that learning then will apply to sort of rigidity and OCD. Yes. Um, yeah, it, it really, it doesn't have to cause anxiety. I find it typically does yeah. for folks. Um, but it, it doesn't have to, um, I think of like, an example of cognitive rigidity and being, uh, keeping someone stuck. Um, I think of this scene from the office. Uh, one of the earlier episodes, Michael Scott is doing improv actually. And he keeps coming up with the same character because he wants to get that scene across. Like, um, he wants to just do that one character and, he's being told like, we'll do something different. No, you're not allowed to like be this, this agent. You, you need to do something different. And because of his rigidity, it ends up ultimately isolating him. Everyone else like doesn't want anything to do with him. They don't want to do the scenes with him where if he had practiced like some cognitive flexibility and, and looked at the big picture of how this was getting in the way of his values of doing improv, it would have helped him connect more to the present moment. Um, improv is actually, uh, I, I don't personally like improv. Um, it would probably be an exposure for myself, but it is a really good way to practice cognitive flexibility. Um, as well as, uh, what's that game? There's a game. Um, I've never played it. Quirkle. It's, it's a really good one. Um, bananagrams. That's a really good, uh, um, cognitive remediation therapy tool as well, because you have to constantly be shifting. You can't get stuck in wanting to do one word. You have to constantly be like, um, thinking of new ways to look at a situation. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I like that. It makes a lot of sense. Um, and obviously, like you say, that that's a lot of what act does is, is trying to prove that psychological flexibility. Yeah. They would call it. Um, Okay. So you you mentioned it earlier, perfectionism, you know, that can play a part in, in many people's OCD. Um, how do, how do you often see this present in your clinical sessions with clients? Like, how are they, how are they talking about it? I guess. Yeah. I mean, it shows up in so many different ways. Um, I do work with a lot of health professionals and, um, medical students and PhD students um, at the medical campus. Uh, But I also work with people in the community. So I'll see it anywhere ranging from 
um, needing to do really well in school. Um, I see more and more, I see a lot of that compulsive procrastination where they are, whether it's schoolwork or even something like um, uh, uh, checking the mail or filling out forms, um, they're not doing it or they're procrastinating or going super slow on it, that compulsive slowness, because they want to do it just right. That fear of making mistakes, that fear of messing up, of not doing it perfectly or just right. Um, so I'm seeing a lot of the just right and perfectionism um, together. So a lot of the work I've been doing, I'm seeing more and more is this procrastination or, or this avoidance um, around tasks like filling out uh, a change of address form um, or filling out um, one's taxes, like having to do sessions where I'm doing, I'm setting a time limit for someone. They're wanting to fill out their taxes over, you know, one simple, simple form. Um, They're wanting to do that in like four hours. I'm like, nope, we have a one hour session and we're going to, we're going to do this one form in probably 30 minutes. So it creates a lot of that um, distress and anxiety, but we're working on like increasing that acceptance and increasing their distress tolerance to the possibility that they might make a mistake or they might not do this perfectly. Um, But I, I see it in with, you know, being the perfect partner, being the perfect um, student, the perfect uh, worker, um, you know, so many different ways, whether it's related to identity or doing certain tasks or even the perfect client, you know, like um, the, the therapy client who wants to really have a, they have a strong people pleasing tendency. So they're showing up uh, wanting to, you know, do all the homework, even if it means they're just like white knuckling it and not actually doing the learning that needs to happen with ERP. Yeah. Okay. Wow. Um, and the, uh, where am I going with this? Yeah. Um, I'm blanking now. Uh, I did this bit. Um, yeah, yeah. I think perfectionism, I don't know what came to my mind as you're talking, you were talking is it itself is a kind of avoidance maybe of like, cause, cause to do something like that form, submit it and get it in, you're then having to live with well is it wrong or uh, was I good enough at it whatever this thing is right. you know so in a way being perfectionistic stops you from getting things done and then having to face the consequences of the or the outcomes of those things yeah is that it, yeah no it's it's it definitely can be a form of avoidance I mean like when it comes down to it OCD like to have OCD without mm. avoidance. Like I don't, I don't see that. I see avoidance as a key component of OCD and um, including the perfectionistic component. It's, you know, avoiding making a mistake, avoiding being criticized, avoiding um, sitting with the uncertainty. Um, it's, I think like perfectionism is a way to feel control over something. There's, not like control is an illusion, just like mm. certainty is an illusion. And, um, perfectionism is just one of those many safety type behaviors or control strategies that doesn't actually work. Um, mm. I mean, it connects really well to the cognitive flex- flexibility piece because something I'll have folks do in, in sessions or um, do things imperfectly, um, as a way to challenge their rigidity. Uh, like if they have the tendency to reread or check an email or a text message, um, a certain amount of times time, uh, for errors or for fear of being perceived a certain way, I will have them do an exposure around sending an email with like a random exclamation point in the middle of a word, um, or, if we're going to increase the distress, like a spelling error or um, a grammar error. And it challenges that perfectionism while also encouraging them to be flexible um, around that rigid expectation. 
rigid, high, unrealistic expectation. Yeah. Yeah. I like that. Um, so you're, you're really using ERP to, in a way, face the perfectionism as well, or like work oh, yeah. with the perfection. Yeah. Oh yeah. I, I love using ERP, um, with perfectionism. Um, mm. I like to say I'm like a recovered perfectionist, although sometimes it pops up still. Uh, but I think that's why I enjoy the ERP so much because I know it, I know it works. Um, yeah especially around the perfectionism, just yeah. challenging because it it's challenging some really core beliefs that someone has that relating their self-worth to, you know, this, this idea of perfectionism um, mm-hmm. or being, you know, this perfect, infallible uh, being. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I guess what comes to my mind, I'm, 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 as I talk here, I'm going to kind of separate OCD and perfectionism, but of course they, they can be very much entangled. Yeah. Um, so it's not quite as clear cut as I'm going to make it. But if we think about some of your clients who are very perfectionistic versus they're not perfectionistic, but just the, they just not, they just have OCD, but you know what I mean? They, they don't have yeah. the perfectionistic element to, um, so when you do ERP in the case of OCD, you're obviously going towards the the feelings, anxiety, guilt, shame, disgust, all of that. And, yeah. and there's resistance to that sometimes because who wants to feel that way, you know? And and sometimes you have to work with that psychoeducation to get them to do it. But with I guess my question is long-winded. Is there more resistance in the people with perfectionism of like letting that go, or is it not? No, it's a great question because I think um, in the most therapeutic answer ever, it depends, right? Yeah. Um, sure. But I think some folks, the perfectionism is so impairing that they're willing to try, you know, anything. I think perfectionism is one of those things that can be harder to challenge. I like to frame it to folks as perfectionism is whether they have OCD or not, perfectionism is unhelpful because it's obsessive and self-critical. And we want to take the adaptive qualities of perfectionism out of that and focus on a balance and focus on the positives of it being tenacity, persistence, drive, motivation, um, uh, what maybe empathy, uh, like extreme empathy. And we want to find that balance, but we want to kind of focus and use ERP as a way of finding those adaptive qualities and leaving behind the obsessive and self-critical. So there's also a lot of self-compassion work that needs to be done when working with perfectionism as well. Um, and I think with folks, they have this, they might have this belief of, well, if I'm doing self-compassion or I'm challenging this perfectionism, I'm going to be lazy or I'm going to, you know, lose my sense of self. Um, and so when I'm, when I frame it more as we're not changing you, we're, we're leaving behind the, the, the things that are bringing you to therapy and, and focusing on taking those positive aspects of your, your character, your temperament, um, your, your personality uh, it's easier for them, like tying it to values yeah. and tying it to the person they want to be yeah. tends to help with that motivation piece. Yeah, that's a really good point. Yeah, because there's nothing necessarily inherently wrong with perfectionism because there's there's good traits within that. It's yeah, yeah, but there's obviously negative ones and it's trying to keep the good but let go of the bad, so to speak. Uh, right. Cool. Yeah, I like that. Um, next question. So uh, social anxiety in particular, in combination with OCD. And I've never actually, as far as I can remember, done a specific episode on OCD with social anxiety. And obviously, I'm sure many of the people listening have, in fact, got social anxiety too, to to varying degrees. Um, My first question really then is like, how often do you see this these two mixing? Like, so your OCD clients also being socially anxious? I see it really frequently. Um, Even if it's not uh, an official DSM diagnosis of social anxiety, there is some sort of anxiety around social situations Mm. with a 
I would say a majority of the folks I, I treat who have OCD. Um, and it, it can be for a number of different reasons. Um, you know, whether it, it can relate to the avoidance of social situations um, because they cause anxiety or they might um, being in social situations might lead to uh, the desire or, or the urge to act on compulsions, um, which causes the avoidance. It could be a fear of being perceived um, in the wrong way mm-hmm. um, or being misunderstood um, or, or being viewed as like a bad person, offending someone or Sometimes there's like an avoidance of social situations for fear of like harming someone because of intrusive, like harm thoughts um, or intrusive sexual thoughts. Um, But it all results in this like avoidance of social or anxiety around being around people. Um, But I I see it quite frequently. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. And then when you're working in, when the two, two are coexisting, um, how are you adapting ERP to try to do well? Do you adapt ERP to try and hit both of them, or are you kind of we're just going to focus on the OCD and maybe this work will have a knock on effect on the social anxiety? I guess I'm saying so, same time or one after the other? <laughs> Man, I hate using this answer, but it depends again, yeah, it depends right? Too. Um, you can do both. I think like I like using ERP to to treat both of both of them. Um, I know I said perfectionism type ERP is my favorite, but social anxiety is too. Um, I actually created like a social anxiety bingo, um, like ERP thing, uh, creating bingo exercises, like to play that game bingo, um, is one of my favorite things to do in therapy for whatever reason. Um, just side note, but, uh, I, I think, with treating the OCD. So if I have someone who um, is fearful in social situations, fearful of offending people, um, fearful of being perceived as awkward or being a bad person, um, I mean, that goes really hand in hand with like treating them both at the same time. Like the ERP is going and being around people and doing um, different sorts of, uh, activities, whether it's like, uh, one, one exposure could be, um, having them tell a really awkward, terrible joke in, in front of people and not like explaining, oh, this was an exposure or, you know, over explaining it, um, or doing that. And then being like, wow, I'm really awkward. And um, sitting with the discomfort that comes up with admitting, like, I'm an awkward person Um, or not asking someone how they're doing, not offering to help them or drive them to the airport. You know, like, uh, I think you can do both at the same time, Um, but you can do them separately. And I think like some of the separate exposures, again, target some of that, like being awkward um, and embracing the awkwardness. I'm, I'm all about embracing the awkwardness. I am an extremely awkward person. So I think I I like to model that for, for my, for my clients, um, by helping them do some of these exposures when we were, (laughs) when we were in person, um, doing our, uh, group for the students on campus, um, Dr. Davis and I would have, we would go out and just do a full group on social anxiety exposures where we would do things like um, walk around campus barefoot or walk um, around campus backwards, um, go. And this one challenged some of the, some like scrupulosity um, and fear of being a bad person. Uh, We would steal in quotations. uh, We would go to the cafe and take, ketchup packets or sugar without buying anything. Mm -hmm. Um, And then we would go outside and squirt it on the concrete so that someone could possibly step in it and maybe we ruined their day. Um, But even just like the act of making a mess is challenging both the OCD and the social anxiety. Um, 
the options are endless. Yeah. Yeah, I like that. The the walking backwards one's funny. And the barefoot one, I mean, if you're at like a Californian college, then it's fine, right? <laughs> it's Just, it's uh, true. It's literally normal. It's not so weird in Colorado either. I okay, guess. fair enough. Yeah. Um Okay, I just lost about the entire West Coast listenership. Um, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, okay, I like that. And obviously, yeah, it depends on what the theme is of the OCD. You can find ways of, like, if if it's, you know, going postal, so to speak, and just, like, you know, losing it in a crowd, then, and you're also socially anxious, go to a party, because then that's hitting both, you know? Um, yeah. yeah. Okay, cool. No, yeah, I like that. To a party and like, if your anxiety is telling you, you have to leave or even, you know, your OCD, you might have like rituals you need to, and compulsions you need to go do. Like if it's like, I can only be there for an hour because I have to go home and do X, Y, Z, you know, the, the kind of exposure and response prevention plan could be like, I'm going to stay here and be the last one at this party to leave. Um, or I'm going to stay here two hours. Um, so that's a good way to challenge it too. Yeah. 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 Nice. Um, okay. So social media obviously has been a big part of many people's lives for last 15, 16 years. Um, (laughs) or maybe it's more than that. If we think about what's the first one, I can't remember. Um, was it Friendster? Yeah, it might be. Yeah. And then, uh, (laughs) MySpace. MySpace. There you go. That's it. Um, But yeah, Facebook was like 2006, I think. Uh, Yeah. So yeah, 15 years ago. Um, And obviously there are massive benefits to social media, especially if we think about the OCD community and how, how much sort of comfort people get and support and courage from others in the community and and also psychoeducation and all of that stuff. So there's lots yeah. of benefits and generally just stay in contact with friends and family that you otherwise may not have time to pick up the phone or go see. But obviously right. with everything, there's always a darker side. Um, maybe not everything, but the social media. Yeah. Um, ha- so ha- how, how is, how is this affecting our mental health? Like the, the more negative aspects of social media. Yeah. I mean, there has been a lot of information in the last couple of months coming out about how it, like there are studies and research showing that it is affecting people's mental health in all sorts of uh, mental health communities. You know, like it's that, that comparison aspect can lead to a lot of depression, a lot of eating disorders um, or disordered eating, a lot of, um, anxiety of like fear of missing out. Um, and it can lead to even suicidal thinking, um, or self harm. Uh, I think like all of those affect mental health. There's also all the bullying and hate that can be on social media. Um, you know, I, I agree there are a lot of positive aspects, but for all the positive aspects there, there are people on those, those sites that aren't, you know, uh, they're not nice people and all of that can culminate and create like a lot of issues for people. Um, and so like I work a lot with my folks on using social media mindfully. Um, and I, you know, you can do ERP around social media use too, because I, I also notice um that for some folks, OCD can be tied into like social media, like compulsions around social media too. Absolutely. Yeah. The, the checking, did I post something? Did I, you know, sometimes my brain goes there if I'm uploading something, I then I have done it where I've gone back and just double check that it didn't accidentally also post a personal picture or something else yeah. or, you know, or a rude one where one of my friends has sent me, you know, like, you know, with those joke ones, not, not nothing like of them. Uh, and so, yeah, so that there's obviously that. And, you know, when, if someone responds to someone, was it, did I respond in a way that hurt their feelings? Even if you knew it was completely okay. Like did something slip in, like we were saying earlier. Um, and obviously self-worth can be tied to it because you're only seeing yep. 
people are only you do get people posting pictures of like their panic attacks and and stuff like that but most of the time and even that that's that's then the other end of the scale you're not seeing that oh here i just made a cup of tea you know right. or a, you're not seeing that and if right. it is it's it's in starbucks and it's got like six inches of cream on top and like a, a, what a flake we'd call it in the uk it's like a chocolate <laughs> stick almost you know yeah, um the perfect lighting exactly yeah 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 um gucci handbag next to it like <laughs> it's it, it's all artificial and staged a lot of it is and and that that can only be negative to a lot of our because our life isn't like that 24 hours a day you know mm-hmm. um yeah. And then, yeah, what else was I going to say on that? Yeah, like you said, there are some people who don't have the best intentions and they're ultimately just hurt individuals that deeply need a hug and psychological intervention um, and support and love. But that being said, their behavior can be disgusting. And and that Mm -hmm. obviously is bullying, a form of bullying, and that can really negatively affect people. Um, And it's hard to get away. So when I think about when I was a teen, you know, if there was bullying, you could go home and that, it was done for the day. You know, there was right. no more bullying. And then now these poor kids are at home and they can't escape, you know, right. these bullies. And also I know with some of my clients, there's like cyber bullying. So they're playing Fortnite or whatever online and then people are just being mean to them over that. And it's, yeah, it's a lot. It's yeah. I mean, it's, it's, you're right. It's, it's hard to escape. I'm, I'm going to date myself and make myself sound old here, but like my sister and I, you know, when we were growing up there, there wasn't social media, but we were like, we experienced both cyber bullying and like uh, cyber bullying over AOL email. Um, And then some like, sexual harassment over AOL instant messenger. Um, and it was definitely like, it had an effect on both of us, um, Mm. like really affected us negatively when we were going through a lot of what we were going through, but this was back in the day when, you know, things took a while to send, they weren't, uh, automatic, um, just popping up and even sending the, the pictures that we would get would just like slowly download. Mm. So that's like, that was, I know that was difficult um, yeah. then, but I can't even imagine now it's, it's so constant. It's like the connection that we have, it can be so great because we're connected all the time, but it can also be so detrimental because we're connected all the time. And, yeah. you know, if someone is kind of like trolling you and, and harassing you, it, it's, it can be hard to let that go. And, um, you know, not want to engage and stand up for yourself. Yeah, it's tough because in in the real world, so to speak, if there was someone bullying you, you know, you could at least you at least have the option to like punch them in the face. You know, like right. I'm, not, I'm not condoning that necessarily, but <laughs> sometimes you know that's probably the best. I'm joking, yeah, but yeah. but you know what I mean. Like there's the, there's the frustrating element of you can't do that. They're hiding behind no. an anonymous account because. Right. they're ultimately afraid but so it's like it, that makes you powerless as well because you can't act and obviously there's bullies right. in real life that may be so big or so terrifying you wouldn't want to punch them in the face but you'd still have the right. choice of doing jujitsu classes and then eventually you'd probably be like right enough you know right um, or, or walking away you know well, yeah like... that's true yeah good point <laughs> <It's> <laughs> see where my, my brain's going my strategy of dealing with bullies is, is <laughs> yeah yeah. I, no, I, I think, but you could like you fight or flight, right? You yeah. you could fight or you could walk away, but the internet, like you can't, because even if you block some of these people, they're going to create another account. They're exactly. going to find another way to, to get to you. Yeah. Um, you know, it's, there's like, what is that saying? Like, don't feed the trolls yeah. because like the people who are trying to like get you to respond, mm-hmm. just like the OCD, you know, like the OCD gets off on us responding emotionally. And so if we're responding emotionally to Mm. the bullies, the trolls on there, it's just going to give them more power. Yeah. Um, Just like the OCD. Yeah, I agree. Um, Yeah. The downside is that you, you as the individual have to take that initial hit of not responding and that hurts, you know? Yeah. Uh, It's hard. Yeah. Um, 
but you ultimately live a better life after that. So then that's right. the payback. Uh, right. So, um, so you know, you, you mentioned about helping your clients use social media mindfully, whether it's around trolls or whether it's just generally using social media. Is there any kind of tips you think the listeners could benefit? Yeah. From? Um, so I think like if we're talking um, mindful use in general, um, I have them start by taking an inventory, like inventory of how much time are you on social media? Are you using it where every time you, you log onto your phone, you instantly click on Instagram? Um, are you using it more during the morning, more at night? What accounts are you following? And then looking at like, do these accounts align with my values or am I like feeling not great after looking at them? Mm -hmm. Um, I talk to them about if it feels really unmanageable and and too anxiety provoking to unfollow someone or block someone, try just muting them, test it out, do a test run, see, see how you feel. You can always refollow them or unmute them. Um, And then I have them to tie back to the flexibility piece if they are the type of person that wake up, wakes up and immediately goes on their phone um, hmm. just to use social media, I'll be like, let's switch up that routine. How about instead you wake up and get right out of bed or wake up and text someone or um, wake up Kindle. Right. Or yeah, read a book, go on Kindle. Um, or how about you only look at social media midday, um, or you only use it for like a minute at a time. That would probably be difficult with internet speed, but, um, you know, like any sort of switching up the routines, um, because they can become so ritualized with how we use it. So switching it up, um, taking like a social media vacation, even I have friends who do that all the time where it's like. I've been on social media a lot. I need to, I need to take like a week off and they just won't engage. But typically it's helpful to tell someone if you're doing that, if that's how you normally communicate. Um, So they don't think you just disappeared. Um, But I think taking that inventory is important to see like where social media is serving you and where it's not serving you. And is your relationship adaptive or not adaptive? Um, yeah. looking at the accounts, um, and then yeah, switching up routines around it, being flexible. Those are the big, big things I work on with folks. Yeah, absolutely. I, I like that. And I think there's something about it as well, like, why am I going on social media right now? Is it because I'm just extremely bored? And like, in which case, sometimes that's okay. But if that's our if that's our only go to when we're bored, then our life's going to get smaller and smaller when we could think, right, if I'm bored, how can I expand my world? What can I learn? What can I go do? Who can I speak to? You know, Um, that's probably goes for like Netflix too. I'm just speaking for myself now. I I feel that. I definitely feel that. But no, it's a, it's a good point. Cause like, are you using it to avoid connecting with people right now? Mm -hmm. Are you using it Like, I know I'm guilty of this if I'm in an awkward social situation and kind of just like in a new situation and just scrolling on my phone to avoid like having to talk to people or, you know, like to look like I'm, I'm busy. Um, like sometimes that's fine, but sometimes that's not helpful because, uh, you could be connecting with others around you and even doing an exposure around social anxiety, perhaps. Yeah. Yeah, I, I agree. That actually happened to me the, the this last week. I was in a pub. I was waiting for my friend, and sitting there. And yeah, I was I was quite happy to just sit there and kind of look around the pub and just be curious and, and take it all in. I mean, obviously, I couldn't necessarily socialize because COVID. People don't want to speak to strangers as much. Maybe they do. That's just my my perception. But they're all in their own conversations, so I didn't want to interrupt and. I'm not the type of person to anyway. So, but anyway, I was, I guess I wanted to sit there and just look around and and rest a bit, but I started to feel self-conscious of what was if people, he's just sitting there by himself, like staring into the abyss. He's not, you know, so, so I had to go out my phone shamefully and, and scrolled and not because it was, it was a value. It was because I was avoiding, you know, that's a perfect example. 
example though. Like I, I probably do that all the time. I think like waiting for people is a great example where in the, in the past, I know like when I was in high school, like we didn't have social media on the phone. So it was always, you know, pick up the phone, pretend you're on the phone with someone like, hi mom. Um, but now it's, it's social media. It's anything to like look busy because you start to get self-conscious. Like what are they thinking? Or what if they like, for, I think for some, for some folks, it's like, what if they notice me? And Mm -hmm. like, what if they see me for who I am? And Mm -hmm. And I know as like a teenager, that's a very uncomfortable thing. I know for folks with um, OCD and eating disorders, it can be a really uncomfortable thing. Even with with trauma, that can be an extremely uncomfortable thing to be seen. Um, So I think the phone can be a great way to avoid that. And great, I mean, sarcastically great. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. It's it's an effective way to avoid that. Yes. Yes. Uh, Absolutely. Um. Okay, so slight change of direction. You could pick yeah. up the phone and call that 20-year-old you. What do you tell her? Oh, 20-year-old me. Um, I would tell her to embrace the awkward and to really, like, embrace who she was and to not to like to let go of trying to fit in like embrace that kind of outsider feeling and if I had embraced that as a 20 year old I wouldn't have felt so isolated I think because I felt so different from from people because of like the OCD and the way my brain worked and Mm -hmm. I think if I had accepted that I wouldn't have tried all the things I was trying to do to fit in and so I would, I would tell, I would tell my 20 year old self to embrace the awkward, embrace, like embrace my full self. Yeah, absolutely. And I love. Like yeah. Embrace and love the awkward. Yeah, true. And then, you know, there's a good chance you would have found your tribe quicker as well by yes. being wholeheartedly who you are. Um, so uh, you've got a billboard in Denver. What do you want written on that billboard? <laughs> um. I would probably, I thought about this. Um, I would say progress, not perfection. Um, that's one of the things I say a lot to my, to my clients because this, this healing process is, is not about, you know, perfection. It's just about taking those, those steps. Even when we have slip ups, it's, it's still progress as long as we keep moving forward from those slip ups. Yeah. So progress, not perfection. Would yeah. Probably that and like embrace the awkward. Okay. TV <laughs> Both <world>. those things. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then lastly, is there anything else you wish you could have said today? Uh, no, I know we covered a lot. I mean, I could always go into so much more detail on these things, but I think like, I, I think I said everything I wanted to say. I'm just so happy to to be on this podcast and, and talking with you this this morning for me, afternoon for you. Yeah, no worries. Well, look, I, I really appreciate your knowledge, your time, and it's been a, a good conversation. Thank you for listening to this week's podcast. If you enjoy the OCD Stories podcast and would like to support us with a one-time tip slash donation, please go to theocdstories.com forward slash support. All tips, no matter how large or small, are greatly appreciated. Please subscribe and rate the show wherever you listen to the podcast. And thank you to NoCD for supporting our work. If you want to find out more about NoCD, head to go.treatmyocd.com forward slash the OCD stories or click the link in the episode description. And quick disclaimer, guys, this podcast is not therapy. It is not a replacement for therapy. Please seek treatment from a trained professional. And until we speak, take care.